Warning. This program may contain material of an explicit or graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Warning. This program may contain material of an explicit or graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Broadcasting Undead from the B-Ward, this is the Postmortem Show. I'm Dom. And I'm JD. And today, we're going to get into the top five horror towns. We're really going to town on this one. No pun intended. <laughs> but you are very punny. All, all puns intended. <laughs> well, we just came off a very fucking successful live show. Extremely. Extremely successful. Packed. To the fucking gills, yeah. 243 people came out to see Behind the Mask. Fucking amazing. Amazing turnout, amazing show, amazing experience getting to hang out with Nathan Basil and David Stevie and, and, and Ben Pace and getting all the other actors on the phone and you know all that. You know, more so than that experience, you know what I really appreciate the most out of this whole weekend? The way the underground horror community came together for this event. Fuck yeah. We raised thousands of dollars. Yeah. It. And it all wouldn't have been possible without Danny Foster. Yeah. We by no means are taking all the credit. No, not at all. Without Danny, none of this would have been. We, we were just puppets on Danny's strings. Yes. <laughs> we're just like it, some know, kind of those real dolls. We're yeah. the real dolls for Danny. We were Danny we're Danny Foster's real dolls, and that's our rating <laughs> system. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Amy would would not appreciate that. <laughs> But it, it was also really cool to see all of the, you know, these companies coming out to support it. You that's know, what the, I mean, the, yeah. The, the guys with the figures, I mean, yeah. all the donations of, uh, and you know, Robbie Shayla from uh, Cherry Blossom yeah. donated $500, $500 tattoo raffle, which yeah. Dom won, yeah. which is rigged. Yeah, and this, the, the weird thing is, this is like the, the maybe the, I think the fourth time I've won a free tattoo. I don't win anything. Yeah, I, I don't win, win anything either I except win for free tattoos. Well... I hope you get something good. Yeah, I'm gonna. It has to be a horror tattoo, so I'm gonna get the alien's face on my pubic area with my dick coming out of its mouth, and then I'm gonna get a little mouth on the head of my dick. He's lying. He's gonna get a tramp stamp of Biff's face. <laughs> Property of Biff <laughs> <laughs> with Biff's fucking stupid face. Yeah, I'm actually. I'm, I'm gonna go see Shayla on Saturday or Friday. I mean, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna get an Evil Dead theme tattoo with the gnarled tree. And the shovel and the cross and the Necronomicon. That's awesome. That's yeah, you show cool. me your concept and I think yeah. it looks pretty sweet. Yeah. But yeah, so we had a great fucking live show. The best live show yet. What is this, our third one or fourth third, one? Third live show. Third live show. Yeah. By far the most people. Absolutely. 240 people. Absolutely. The most famous guests live. You know, we've done our first live show just kind of on our own. We did yeah. the second one with the blessings of the man himself, Lucifer Valentine, where we screen Regurgitated Sacrifice. And now this. And it's only coming up. From here, we're gonna we have the trifecta of Central Coast horror now. Yeah, Danny Foster, us, and Cherry Blossom Tattoo. We're all gonna be coming together. We're gonna be promoting some more screenings, some, some more horror houses. events, haunted houses. 
This shit is going to be the mecca of horror. Fuck yeah. The mecca of horror in the the central coast of California. It's not L.A. It's not Haddonfield. It's not Camp Crystal Lake. It's none of our horror towns from today's list. It's right here. It's right now. The best time to be is now. The best place to be is here. I said it backwards. You get the reference. It's our time down here. Down here, it's our time. (laughs) Up there, it's their time. (laughs) Inhaler. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, that's what that's some post mortem news, but we're gonna get into now is a little bit of horror news. Horror news. Gearbox CEO Randy Pitchford has stated in a recent YouTube interview that a Duke Nukem movie is in the works. He says we're working on Duke Nukem. I can't announce it fully, but it's blown my mind. There's been a lot of production... It's blown my load just right now. (laughs) There's been a lot of production companies that have come at us. We're putting together a deal right now with a major motion picture studio. I'll tell you off the record if you want to know. It's the exact right people that should be doing a Duke Nukem film, and we'll see what happens. It's unbelievable, and I think it's very likely to be a thing. They've said in further articles that they're going into it not serious at all. That's great. And they're going for violence and comedy. Which is exactly yeah, what Duke Nukem needs to be. You have a bunch of be. boobs, pig cops, Duke Nukem himself. The casting is so important. Yeah. No one else matters to the casting but Duke. Yeah. You know who it's got to be? The dudes. Doug, Duke, Duke Doug, Nukem. <laughs> Doug Nukem. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Nukem, if you're fancy. <laughs> I've come here to kick ass. And it's Mac tonight! <laughs> <laughs> kick ass and you Big Max. A very... Tall and lanky Duke Nukem, played by our our buddy Doug Jones. I would be shocked if the Dukes was not involved in that when it was finally put into production. Oh yeah, he's got to be an octobrain. Yeah, he's an octobrain. No, he's the ones that hop up and shoot the shit out of him in the atomic edition. The yeah. one that shoot the radiation. That's the Dukes. He's, him and Javier Botet have. To so be who are you gonna cast that. as Duke Nukem? Fuck, that's hard. Um, I mean, you know, there's there's guys out there. You know, Ron Perlman or fucking fuck Ron Perlman, nah. Duke Nukem. No, <laughs> no. Who are you thinking? Kevin Nash, Dolph Lundgren as Duke Nukem. I could see that. He he proved his chops with Don't Kill It. Yeah, that, that he can. He do, has to be yeah, Duke. That he could do more than than what we know as Dolph. Yeah, he's still pretty ripped. He's yeah, and he could get more ripped. He can get more ripped. He yeah. can get a flat top. He can reprise his role from Rocky. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. He looked like that back now, but it had the acting chops yeah. of now. Yeah. Man, that's a perfect actor. I, yeah, that would be good. My second choice, Harvey Firestein. <laughs> I've oh. come to kick ass and chew bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All these pig cops. I'm going to call my lawyer. <laughs> I'm gonna rip off your head and shit down your neck. <laughs> Hail to the king, baby. I have a feeling it's gonna be someone like Tom Hardy or someone like It's that. gonna be the yeah. fucking rock. Let's be honest. Oh, God. <laughs> with, a, with a blonde flat top and no tan. <laughs> They're gonna, like, paint him white. No, they're just gonna leave him the same. He's gonna have black hair. It's just gonna be the rock. He's still gonna have his tribal tattoo. Eyebrow. <laughs> you know, if you're going wrestlers, I'd say Brock Lesnar would be better Duke Nukem. He's got rock. the right look. They but have to his little voice. baby voice. Hail to the king, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that would work out. No, not at all. <laughs> I, but I'm very looking forward to that. That's something that I've wanted my entire life. Yeah. As I've said on previous shows, I was number four in the world at Duke Nukem Multiplayer when I was 12 years old on Case's Ladder Ranking System. I am a Duke Nukem fanatic. Duke Nukem, Doom, and the other one would be Half-Life. That could be a great movie. But yeah. I don't think we're ever going to get it. I'll hold my breath. But if we're going to get some Duke Nukem, that's going to make me... A very, very happy little boy. Happy, happy lad. Happy in the pants. Another thing that would make me happy is they're saying now another Freddy vs. Jason movie could be a lot closer than you think. Really? Indeed. So, after their initial showdown, fans have been eager to watch Freddy and Jason square off again, proving horror fanatics still have a taste for more versus films with the slasher genre, even though we have Alien vs. Predator. Thanks to the cancellation of Paramount's Friday the 13th reboot, we might actually see Freddy and Jason go for round two. You remember the wink? I remember the wink. There was a wink. 2003, Paramount Pictures negotiated a deal with New Line Cinema and Warner Brothers to reacquire the rights to Jason and the Friday the 13th series. But there was a catch. If Paramount didn't manage to produce a Friday the 13th sequel within five years, the rights would revert back to New Line Cinema. 
Now, we're in 2017, four years later, Paramount has no intentions of releasing its Scrap Jason reboot, meaning New, Light Cin- New Line Cinema will ultimately take back the rights to the franchise. Paramount is also in the middle of a legal battle with the guy who wrote the first Friday the 13th as to who owns the rights to it, but what it would, but it's the rights to the Friday the 13th name, because yeah. he doesn't own Jason Voorhees as we know him. Yeah, Freddy so, vs. Jason would be fine. So yeah, so that wouldn't get in the way. Well, the good news about this is that New Line Cinema owns Freddy. Right. And Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. So if the rights go back to that, we're going to fucking get it. You know, with all the cashing in of the fucking mummy and shit. Yeah. They're looking for reboots. They're looking. No one has any creativity. Yeah. You can make this and make it work. What I'm really hoping is that we finally get like the comic book, Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash. That would be awesome. Versus Reanimator. I'm in. I just shoehorned the reanimator yeah. at the end because I'm not supposed to talk about it anymore, but it's my but favorite movie. Yeah. Versus, my favorite movie. versus Dennis. <laughs> versus Dennis. Um, Pretty sure Dennis had the shit in the stick on that one. Yeah, yeah. But it would be it would be glorious when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope they can get Robert England back for that. There's no word yet. As... I, I know he'd do it. I'm hoping they're smart enough to bring him back. Oh, they would. If he'd do it, I'm sure they would. Yeah. So. Cool. Hellboy creator Mike Mignola announced that his demonic superhero would be getting a movie reboot starring Stranger Things Sheriff David Harbour as the titular character. This has been slightly he says pre- tit. Yeah. Uh, this has been slightly preceded by uh, Guillermo del Toro announcing that his Hellboy 3 was 100% dead. And more recently, in a chat with THR, del Toro was quoted as saying, I don't own Hellboy, Mike does, so you know, he's the father of the character, and if he wants to reboot it, it's perfectly fine. I got to make two, and that's two more than I thought I would get to make. So as far as I'm concerned, Godspeed and God bless. So we might get more Hellboy, it might be a different vision of it, but you know, it's cool to see uh, Del Toro being professional about it. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I like Del Toro as a person, I don't think he's a dick. No, no, I think he's... he's Definitely got a good head on his shoulders. I do think he does the two good, two, two bad movies, one good movie plan. Yeah, I'm going to make money. Yeah, by taking these two movies, and I'm going to make something good. Yeah. I'm going to make money. I'm going to make something good. Yeah, for sure. Which I'm not a fan of. Yeah, but it is what it you got to do. What you got to do. You should make them under different names, though. Like that's that's what Takashi Miike does. He directs like TV movies and fucking commercials and shit like that under different names in Japan. Michael Takashi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Takashi Michel. Um, <laughs> it's a French, French, Japanese yeah. movie. Uh, and then he gets his money to make the movies that he wants to make. So, but you know, you got to do what you got to do in Hollywood. And but there's always scat necrophilia, no matter what. Right. Lifetime movies presents a <laughs> film by Takashi Michel <laughs> to, at a French. <laughs> Even in death, you shit on me. He's doing an Oreos commercial or something for <laughs> Japan with dead. <laughs> Dead women shitting on Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'd buy them in that, if that was the case. So, it's been almost 35 years since John Carpenter's first big studio movie, 1982's The Thing. Which was made for Universal. It was released and metamorphosized from flop, from box office flop to underground classic in the horror genre. This is coming from Nerdist, this article. Which is something that I've known, but I don't think a lot of people have known, so... It's all well documented how successful it's been, but Carpenter's Masterpiece isn't merely a great example of monster horror. It's a perfect example of cosmic horror, Lovecraftian horror. Absolutely. A notoriously difficult subgenre to represent on screen. Many try, many fail. Yeah, most fail. H.P. Lovecraft was a complicated writer. He's become the stuff of legend, and his creations of the Necronomicon and the Cthulhu. Mythos, a hundred years ago, have inspired writers from filmmakers Guillermo del Toro to Sam Raimi. But all of the things in the genre Lovecraft can be credited with popularizing, if not inventing, cosmic horror is perhaps his most important and most ineffable. Yeah. Cosmic horror is the realization that they're ancient, holy, and human creatures that exist in our own universe. With the 35-year anniversary of the thing, they're supposed to be getting a re-release with some extras and stuff where they're actually going to tie it in and speak a little bit about Lovecraft because it's... It almost seemed like a ripoff, mm-hmm. you know. It's Lovecraftian body yeah, horror. That's it's, what it's it absolutely is. Take, it takes place in Lovecraft. They're Lovecraft supposed world. to be getting some kind of re-release where they're actually going to give the man his due. But I think that uh, the thing is a movie that stands the test of time, absolutely. As we all know. So if you guys are a fan of the show, you haven't seen it. It's thirty-five years later. You got to watch the thing. Don't yeah. put it off. Check it out. 
it's it's not one of those old movies that's crappy now. You know, it, it will hold up for another thirty five years. Yep, and twelve years later, after he made it, in the mouth of madness, fully exploring the H.P. Lovecraft road. Yep, I think that to me, in the mouth of madness is his masterpiece. But the thing it could be arguable, but the Lovecraftian influence of John Carpenter through those movies, mm-hmm. it just begs for the next one. Yeah. Well, I feel like all of his movies kind of take place in the same world. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and The Thing, and In the Mouth of Madness, and Prince of Darkness, and all those movies, like, they're all Lovecraftian as fuck. Especially Prince of Darkness. That movie's super Lovecraftian. And The, and, uh, uh, the Fog. It just really, uh, it really shocked me when I saw this article from a mainstream site, like mm-hmm. The Nerdist. That's why I wanted to talk about it. Yeah. Saying that, oh, The Thing has ties to H.P. Lovecraft. Everybody, you gotta know this. Yeah. You know, which... Obviously, we know that. that. Yeah, I'm sure most of our fans listening know that. Yeah. But if you don't, it just I needed to say it. Yeah, I needed to put it out there. Absolutely. So. <laughs> Did you see the remake of the thing? It was horrible. You didn't like the it? Danish one? Yeah. Yeah. Or fin- Finland, Danish, Scotland, something like something that. Like that. I don't know. But they were wearing kilts and wooden shoes <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> at the Had same time, for some and those little hats and the dye woodies. <laughs> 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 the spenders did something. I, was, I, I thought the thing remake was a solid movie, but the CG uh, ruined it. It's just not the same. Yeah, it's just bastardizing to me. Yeah, so. I would have rather have had like a sequel or something. Yeah, I'd just rather not have them touch it if they're going to put their grubby little hands they're, on the thing. Their grubby little Serbian. <laughs> they're going to put their it. grubby little Swedish hands on my <laughs> thing. Furdy, furdy, furdy. Don't furdy, furdy my thing. <laughs> Last person that did that, I was seven years old, and they went to jail. <laughs> they don't furdy, furdy my thing. I have John Carpenter news too. Oh, wow, okay. A comic book entitled Big Trouble in Little China, Old Man Jack, is being published by Boom Studios. That's B-O-O-M with an exclamation point. You gotta say it like that. Boom! (laughs) With the first issue debuting this September. The description reads, Old Man Jack is set in the year 2020, and hell is literally on earth with the demon god Ching Dai declaring himself ruler of all. Jack Burton is alone in Florida with only his broken radio for company until one day it picks up a message. Someone is out there in the hellscape, and they know a way to stop Ching Dai. The comic will be written by John Carpenter and Anthony Birch, with illustrations by Jorge Corona, and early art releases hint at a possible return of David Lopan. Oh, awesome. That's great. Yeah. David That's the Lopan best part. Is, my, is my favorite cinematic villain. Yeah, he's he, one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. Him and, and Frank Langella as Skeletor. Like, yeah, Frank like, Langella as Skeletor is fucking amazing. Yeah. Uh, People talk shit about that movie. I've probably seen it 200 times. Yeah. I still have my VHS. Yeah, I've got it on. I went and bought it on DVD when my VHS broke, and uh, I I go back to it once or twice a year. Too. So, do you like it, like re redone for DVD and shit? I feel like I'd like the VHS more. The, oh, the DVD that I got was the five dollar one, so it's not really redone. Oh, it's, it's still kind of grimy, ripped. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the, it's like like there's no bonus features, there's no commentary. It's just like the DVD, and then you plug it in, it starts playing it. instantly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like, when you stop it, it might go to the, the menu, but the menu's not even moving. It's just like a single screen with yeah. music. Yeah. All right. The cheap-ass DVDs. Uh, yeah. It's been well-established on the show that I love Big Trouble and Little Shot Yeah. And I'm a comic book nerd, so I'll definitely be jumping on this. And it's cool to see things like this and, you know, what they're doing with Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie, or Return of Leslie Vernon, Vernon the, the comic book sequel, you know, where if they're not going to do it cinematically, at least they're still giving us continuations of the story. Not to go off on a major tangent here, which I'm about to do, but it's been a while since we did the movies that need a sequel. Uh huh. I have a sequel for you. Oh yeah. To Big Trouble in Little China. Oh yeah. Little Trouble in Big China, where they're shrinking down like Honey I Shrunk the Kids <laughs> in real China. Mm-hmm. They have to navigate the wall. Lopan has become a giant behemoth. What do you call those Japanese monsters like in Pacific Rim? Oh, uh, uh, kaiju? Kaiju. <laughs> kaiju Lopan. <laughs> Versus tiny, tiny, tiny little man Jack. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> I, I, I would watch that. Yeah, we needed to get back into some creative shit. Yeah. But we did have an idea on our way to the live show. We're doing towns right now. Yeah. Listener Eileen has sent us some really good lists that we're going to get to. We're going to do some of those. And we're also going to cast our own serial killer movie. That's right. I forgot about that. We need to do it. Yeah. It's been a while. We've done a lot of top fives, but it's been a while since we actually went. My creative juices are flowing. There's leakage. Creative pre-cum. In your 
why are you giving me that look? Weird, weird <laughs> okay, I got one last thing of horror news. Uh, Sorry, do you need anything to say about that? Nope. So, Cyanide Studio. Ever since twelve years ago, Dark Corners of the Earth. Great game. It was a financial flop, though. It was. But now they're ready for the new Call of Cthulhu video game, which I was too excited to not tell you before we recorded. Yep. And we had to watch several trailers together. Yeah, three of them. Three trailers, because this Call of Cthulhu game looks fucking awesome. Yeah, it looks really good. Great graphics, great scenes. People at Focus Home Interactive set up a behind-closed-doors presentation at E3 where they showed about 20 minutes of the game in action to different critics. People were blown away by it. The nice. graphics are amazing. It's about goddamn time. And the gameplay. They said a lot of these games like this, good graphics don't equal good games. No, not always. It's yeah. great to have good graphics, but it all matters in the gameplay. Yeah. And it's You're a detective. You have to investigate, you know, clues and stuff. Not really detective, but that's, you're doing detective work yeah. in the game. And it looks fucking awesome. If you guys haven't seen it, just search on YouTube. Maybe we'll share the link on our Facebook. The E3 2017 Call of Cthulhu trailer. Yeah, it's it's fucking spectacular. We'll definitely be picking this up. Yeah. I hope it's released for Xbox or at least it, it, said, it said it was. Oh, it did say yeah. it was? Okay, I didn't yeah. see that. I, there's no uh, console release or date on the article. That yeah, it said awesome. Xbox One, PS4. And while we were looking at that, I actually ran across another trailer for a game called Scorn that I sent you that looks like a first-person shooter set in a world of H.R. Geiger where even your weapons are made of flesh. And, like, in the gameplay demo, when the guy was reloading, he had to, like, break off the clip and pull out the nerves. And then a new one had to reattach the nerves. And oh, that's like, awesome. Like, everything is flesh and blood. And, it's yeah. kind of like the, there's a gun that's an alien hand that shoots bees in Half-Life. You need to play that stuff. <laughs> that's like, hilarious. And stuff, but it's awesome. Yeah? Yeah. And a little, little, uh, like a secretive gland where you kind of milk it. When you milk it, all these aliens come up through the floor and start helping you kill things. Nice. Yeah, there's some cool stuff in there. That's weird. Still got to play it. Yeah. So, milky secretions, that's our race. <laughs> Done. <laughs> no. Tiny, tiny Jack, big low pan. I don't know. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get a rating system. Yeah. We're doing I'm at sure, the movies anyway, so... Yes, I'm sure during our first movie of At The Movies, we'll think of something. So, stay tuned for At The Movies. It's been a while. Yeah. We've done a lot of good and bad. We've done some... Der Streiner Schnitzel. Der Schnitzel. But stay tuned for At The Movies after this. And then the top five horror towns. Hi, thanks for listening to the Postmortem Podcast. If you want to support us, go to our website at www.postmortemshow.com and click the Amazon link. By clicking on the Amazon banner, Amazon will give a small percentage of the purchase price of your item back to the Postmortem Podcast at no additional cost to you. That's right. It doesn't cost you any money. We get money. You want us to keep doing this? You want more Doug Jones talk? You want more dick and fart talk? I don't care. We're going to do it. Fund our filthy, filthy habits. Yes, and you, they are many and they are fast. And most of them aren't legal. <laughs> yes. Click the banner. Just do it. Come on, don't be a dick. Give us money. Let's go down to the movies with Dom and JD, the Blood Boobies, and Doug Jones! Psychos, monsters, bloody slashes, maniacs, and tits and asses, chainsaws, knives, and facial bashes on postmortem! Let's go down to the movies with Dom and JD for some more Doug Jones! No, Doug Jones! Yes, we went to the movies, and we saw Herschel Gordon Lewis, the Godfather of Gore documentary. The Gore Father of God. Wait. The the Godfather of Gore. The Gore Father of Whore. The Whore Father? The Whore Father of Gore. What? Whatever how you want to say it. The Godfather of Gore. And what was the name of the other movie that we saw? Let Me Make You a Martyr. Let Me Make You a Martyr. Uh, that's a fucking mouthful. Yes. Let me that. give you a mouthful to say it when you're saying the title of my movie. Let me give you a mouthful. <laughs> so, let's start out with 
The Godfather of Gore. It's a 2010 documentary directed by Frank Henenlotter and Jimmy Malson. Herschel Gordon Lewis, The Godfather of Gore. Documentary chronicles the career of legendary schlockmaster Herschel Gordon Lewis. One of the pioneers of the gore movies. Perhaps the inventor of gore movies. Perhaps. Based on this documentary, they do paint yeah. him in that light. Yeah, I mean, there, there were gory movies before he did before he did them, but he was really, according to this documentary, at least one of the first to really just home in on it. Yeah, and just make it nothing about that. He just, his movies are a one-trick pony. Yeah. You know, he made all those nudie movies. The cutie nudies. Nudie cuties. Nudie cuties. Yeah. And then the score movies. And it's just, it's one or the other. Yeah. We've evolved now, today, to where we can get some nudity and some gore and some comedy. At the and, same or some seriousness yeah. in one. But for him, it was all one thing, but yeah. it worked at and the time. He even says in the documentary, like he himself, there's no such thing as a good Herschel Gordon Lewis movie. There's Herschel Gordon movie, Lewis movies that you like, but none of them are actually good movies. Yeah, he said that there's no good movie yeah. of his. There's just your favorite movie of yeah. his. You can just rank them what this is my favorite one. Yeah. Of the bad. <laughs> this documentary wasn't afraid to, to get down to the nitty gritty and portray him in both a positive and sometimes a negative light. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that the negative light, though, I don't think that was intentional. I think this was a fluff piece uh-huh. to make him look good. But some of the negative light, he portrays himself that way yeah. because he's just kind of comes off like a douche. He's a carny. He is. <laughs> <laughs> he's a fucking carny. But I love him. Yeah. I, mean, I, wish it, I think it takes a carny to like really pioneer something like that. I wish that. he was my grandpa. Yeah? That would be awesome. Yeah. What are you doing in my old movie, son? I'm just looking at your nudie cuties, grandpa. <laughs> well, if you're going to watch them, watch this one. <laughs> Yes, the doc wasn't afraid to get down to it, like I said, but it also delivers the gore nudity that Herschel Gordon Lewis was known for. Yeah, uh, a lot of the uh, story was told through interviews, not just with Lewis, but also the other producers he worked with, the actors that he worked with. Um, the uh, John Waters had a bunch of interviews yeah. in there. Yeah, most of the doc is narrated by Herschel Gordon Lewis, yep. but... Like you said, there's also interviews with Joe Bob Briggs from Monster Vision. Fuck yeah. The man himself. I love me some Joe Bob yeah. Briggs. Legendary John Waters and more. Basically starts off about the nudity in film and censorship before it gets to the gore and horse aspect. There is probably, this movie is probably a third revolving around like nudity movies that like they couldn't put out porn to make yeah. it mainstream. So they made softcore So they just porn. made like this softcore porn where it's not even porn. There's no sex. It's just naked women running around yeah. driving cars. Playing tennis. Playing tennis and like riding bicycles and that kind of shit. And then finally it does get to the horror and gore which I was not I was not against the naked women playing volleyball. No, no, not at all. <laughs> by, by any means. And you know for, for it being the time that it was a lot of the old nudity and the old movies it's not that appealing, some of them, yeah. you know? But some of these were pretty good, so. Yeah, it's... You were right, it did feel more like a fluff piece where just sort of some of his seediness sort of seeped to the surface. Yeah. Um, I also felt like it was more geared towards people who were already established fans of yeah. his work or, like, film students. Like, this is a great documentary for a film student to watch. Yeah, or a fan of his. Yeah, I don't Or a know fan that, of the genre. Yeah, I don't know that it would have much appeal to someone outside of that, though. There's a reason why it's not on Netflix. Yeah. Like, this is a perfect little Netflix throwaway piece that, you know, they have a thousand documentaries, but I just don't think it would appeal to the wider audience yeah. based on what it is. Uh, so after the nudies and nudist movies, there was a lot of competition Yeah, in that genre. Everyone was doing it. You can get some bitches naked for pretty cheap. Yeah. But, so he decided to get into the gore business with Blood Feast, which a lot of people say is his best movie. Yeah. I do not agree. Yeah. My favorite part of this doc was the 2000 Maniacs breakdown. That's yeah. my favorite one of Absolutely. his Absolutely. Absolutely. And I like the way that they... This is the best part about the filmmaking in this documentary. They showed clips from the movie and also Herschel Gordon Lewis and one of the producers were in a car. Yeah. And they were kind of reenacting like they were in the movie. Yeah, they went back to the old places where they shot it. In and the a lot same of car. the same. Yeah. yeah. And they had people come cool. up to the car like Pleasant Valley. Yeah. Yee-hoo! Waving their fucking Confederate fuck flags and all that. 2000 Maniacs, like I said, is one of my favorite of his movies. It is my favorite, probably. It's probably I think my number the, one. The Wizard of Gore is my favorite. I like uh, the uh, one with the Suicide Girls, the remake. That one's good, too. Yeah. What's his name? The Rat Face guy. Uh, uh, Willard. Crispin Glover. Crispin Glover. Yeah. I love Crispin Glover. I can never remember his name. That being said, 
This is one of the few where the remake is so much better. Yeah. 2000 Maniacs, the remake with Robert England yeah. as the mayor and Lynn Shay and my buddy Madman Pondo as the blacksmith. Yep. I only see him a couple times, but he bought me pizza. I like that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Deathmatch Legend. American Deathmatch Legend. But I love the 2000 Maniacs remake, so. I, uh, I think it was a good look at the history of gore movies, where they came from. I think it was done lighthearted and, and funny, especially when you see how not serious Lewis was about his work. Yeah. Like, he wasn't trying to... They wrote that. the script for Blood Feast on the way to go film Blood Feast. Yeah. Oh, let's do some Egyptian shit. Uh, get some hot girl. This one was a playboy. Let's use her. She's not an act. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> They had no idea how to do gore and stuff. They just went and got a bunch of like parts. Yeah, they got, a bunch they got of like a, a, and then they were like rotting on set, and the whole yeah. set was stinking. And they had to get those like pine air fresheners and hang them up where they, yeah. in the room where they were storing the guts. <laughs> it's fucking you know that's that's how you do it when you don't know what you're doing. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. Is that what they say? That is what they say. The worst part about this to me was there's pretty poor sound quality on the interviews, like the in studio interviews. Yeah. Of Herschel Gordon Lewis, when it's him, when the in the like the images projecting behind him, and there's like a little studio. It looks like they set out to film this, but the sound, I don't know if they were just using the camera sound for the microphone. Probably they didn't even have a fucking boom mic or what. But yeah. it, the sound design was pretty shitty yeah. on the actual interviews of everyone. The John Waters one wasn't as bad. Right, like you can tell they filmed it different places at different times. The interviews tried to make it look the same. Yeah, but um, yeah, his. And he's the main focus of the movie. You got to get his sound right. Yeah. You know, you got to go back and clean it up. If not, but I guess yeah, just like his movies, something. they don't give a fuck. Don't give a fuck. Here's the way it is. We're not going to spend five more minutes on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's five minutes that we could be fucking drinking at the bar. <laughs> yeah, we could be drinking at the bar. We could be paying girls to run around and play naked volleyball. If you're not a fan of Herschel Ron Lewis, you probably would be bored with this. But it was cool seeing the story. Subject matter is interesting, but it's not the best made documentary, and it's not very compelling. Yeah. In my opinion, a good documentary should capture the viewer and make them care, even if they had no interest whatsoever in the subject. Yeah. Advance, uh, examples for me would be Print the Legend, a documentary about 3D printing that I saw on Netflix, which was amazing. Really? Which I don't give a fuck about yeah. that. And Pumping Iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't give a fuck about bodybuilding and weightlifting. This is a fucking good documentary. It's like awesome. a calming. Yeah, I'm always calming. calming. Every minute of every day, I'm just, I just, I'm, I feel like I'm calming because it's like, it's not like sex, but my body's calming all the time because I'm in such a good shape. <laughs> and then he later went on to be the governor. Yeah. And now Donald Trump is the president. Yeah. And he hates Donald Trump. Fuck you, America. <laughs> um, yeah. As I How could we elect these characters? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, this would be boring to those not familiar with the genre, but for those of us who love it, it's a great informational piece. I did find myself getting up and doing other things while I was watching it, though. Like, I yeah, got, I was I got up and folded laundry while I was watching it. Yeah, <laughs> I was not focusing 100%. I was trying to. I knew yeah. we were going to review it. We were down on time. Yeah. I watched it Sunday. We had the live show Saturday. Yeah. We had a lot of preparation, a lot of shit, a lot of energy went into that yeah. on everyone's part. And uh, so I was a little bit burnt out. Mentally burned out. I've had a rough week. Yeah. So I took it with a grain of salt. Yeah. You know, I tried to give it a better review in my rating. I bumped it up by a full point from what I would have given it. Yeah, so did I. I missed, so. All right. Well, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 70s bushes and volleyball titties. <laughs> <laughs> IMDb gives it a 7.3, which I was surprised by it was so highly rated. Mm. But I also went with 7 out of 10 70s bushes. And volleyball titties. And a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> it's Christmas. <laughs> the B word. We also watched Let Me Make You a Martyr. A Martyr. Which at first I was like, what, don't you take Martyr's name in vain? You better not be making another room. Like, oh wait, it's a different movie. It yeah. just has the same word. Different movie. And then so. I calmed down. I immediately put the gun away. <laughs> you, you, you were going to go kill Corey Asraf and John Schwab, the directors of this 2016 American Gothic exploitation film. I was. I was setting out on the road in my hoopty. So this movie, Let Me Make Your Martyr, stars Marilyn Manson, Mark Boone Jr., who is Bobby Elvis, and Nico Nicotera, who's also from... Sons of Anarchy. It's a cerebral revenge film about two adopted siblings 
who fall in love and hatch a plan to kill their abusive father. Yeah, a little bit of semi-incest happening there. Yeah, there was. They were very casual about it, too. Yeah. (laughs) It was glorified. Glorified incest. Yeah. 70s Bush glorified incest for volleyball titties. Um... This movie, I felt like it was very much a combination of like Jim Jarmusch and Alejandro Jodorowsky, just set in a dirty South backdrop. It reminded me a lot of the movies Dead Man and El Topo. Like the story jumped back and forth, and I think a lot of what happened was supposed to be symbolic and not literal. And there's also a good chance that most of the story was either happening in the main character's head or it was taking place in some kind of purgatory. And everything that went down was like killing off of various psychological archetypes, like Lucifer Valentine does. Which would explain how the narrator knew things that he shouldn't have known. And I hope that's the case. No, it's just bad writing. Because if it's not, then it's it was just bad, bad writing. writing. I don't... I See, I, that's a good comparison, but I disagree. I think that this guy saw a lot of Quentin Tarantino movies. Mm. With the Pulp Fiction back and forth plot, that mm. kind of thing. And the music in this movie, it's very Tarantino. Oh yeah, very much. Very much. And also, I think that... like. To make it more modern, he might he might have watched some Jeremy Sonnie movies, mm-hmm. like Green Room, Blue but, Room. Have you seen the movie Dead Man? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah this movie, like, 50% of it was Dead Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a dirty movie about dirty people doing dirty things. Yeah. That's it, what it is. Yeah, but it, 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 it felt dirty watching it, which is exactly how it was supposed to feel. So, yeah, in, in terms no, that, of was, that, yeah. that was what translated well. It starts off with good old Marilyn Manson. And another guy come into a guy's house, and the dude freaks the fucks out. They're there to kill him or collect a debt or something. Then we meet Drew, played by Nico Nicotera, being inter- interrogated in the police station. Then it bounces to a drug dealer in a trailer and an abducted child. Then it's Bobby Elvis. I didn't know it was my super stressful last last couple of weeks or the concussions talking, but it was really hard to follow. <laughs> yeah, it did jump around a whole lot. It, it felt like they only had like limited access to all of their actors except for Nico Nicotero so they just shot little chunks of things and then put them all together what it felt like to me is that they filmed two and a half hours of product and cut it down to an hour 40 taking out vital plot points out with it you know like this movie should have been 30 minutes longer to explain all this shit it's filled with despicable characters and drugs adoption incest like I said Marilyn Manson as an actor is awesome I've never been a fan of his move of his music but as an actor and a free speech advocate, I, I'm t- eternally a fan of yeah. his. But. I, I, you know, Marilyn Manson was like a huge part of my, my teenage years. Yeah. I was a huge Marilyn Manson fan from his very first album. Like, I, I had some friends that were from Florida, and they introduced me to Marilyn Manson before he even really hit the market big. And I was just fucking hooked. And, you know, I, I still go back, and he still makes good music. He still cuts good albums. And those albums still hold up when I go back and listen to them. And I was worried when he said when he was going to start transitioning and acting that he wasn't going to be good, and I was yeah. going to be totally let down. But he has totally like proven that he is he is a very well rounded performer for sure. You know what I want to see him do? I want to see him be a starring role in a movie as the heel, as the bad guy, the mm-hmm. main antagonist in a movie because he's played these bit parts. Yeah. He was the Nazi guy on Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. He's done this. I want to see him get the reins, be the killer. Yeah, because in, in this one, he wasn't even really the bad guy. He was sort of morally ambiguous, which you I know, liked. And he wasn't even the major part of the movie. Yeah. He was a ancillary character. Yeah. So. You know, going back to my, my sort of analysis of it, where I, I, I do think some of it was actually happening in the guy's mind or in some sort of purgatory setting. And I feel like Marilyn Manson represented like some sort of death angel. Because he didn't really... Like, he killed people. But he would, like... Like, with the scene with the old junkie guy, when he was sitting down talking to him, and, and everything that he did, it wasn't just he was a murderer, or he, even that he was doing it for the money. It was that he was... He was trying to accomplish something. Yeah. I got that, too. But I don't think it's as deep as, as you do, yeah. personally. I was also a huge fan, and I am a huge fan, of Michael Seamus Wiles. You know who that is? He played one of the priests. He's the guy with the weird cheeks. Oh, like, yeah. Mark cheeks. Yeah. He's been in a shitload of stuff. My favorite role of his was he was this weird cowboy in Hellraiser Inferno. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. He was talking about the engineer and stuff. I love his acting. He's just so deadpan. Yeah. You know, he's been in Sons of Anarchy. He's been in all this shit. You yeah. Know, a lot of Sons of Anarchy going on in this movie. Yeah, for sure. This guy's a fan of Sons of Anarchy and Quentin Tarantino, yeah. so... Some of the other acting was way over the top, like the trailer drug dealer guy, you know? Yeah. Where the kid the was. Redneck. And the guy at the beginning, too, when they first get to that house. Yeah. Way over the top. Yeah. 
The it's, core actors, though, were excellent. Like I said, it comes off like a least, uh, less talented Tarantino and still learning. So yeah. it's too heavy-handed for my taste at times. Definitely not violent enough for being built, built as a revenge movie. Yeah. There's not enough violence in this movie. It's yeah. just a bunch of drug use and shitty people. But yeah, and the, all, all the couple action gunshots, happens off screens. I, yeah, I want to see some brutal torture yeah. revenge. And, and the one like the one violent scene was like a character that wasn't really all that important. Yeah, you know, it's, you, you bill it as a, it's it does say a cerebral revenge film, yeah. but you bill it as a revenge film that has to be a payoff, and this movie lacked that yeah. payoff. And I felt also like the dialogue in it was intentionally obtuse. Like they they used the wrong pronouns and stuff like that. Like they all talked like they knew what they were talking about, but no one else knew what the fuck they were talking about. Yeah. And I, I think if you have to do that to lend a sense of mystery to your story, you're being a hack. I agree, and also I wasn't a fan of the ending. We were not going to spoil this since it just came out, but the ending to me was the most ham-handed shit in yeah. the entire movie. It was ridiculous. Yeah. It was almost pathetic. It, that's where I was like, "This is gonna, this is okay. This guy's gonna learn." And then that ending hit, and I was all, "Boom!" Yeah. I thought it's like, it's like when the when you get a boner at the nurse's office, you know, when she's giving you a physical, and then she just flicks the shit out of the tip of your dick. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, Bing! I've never had that happen. <laughs> Dick flicking nurses. How many of those would you give this movie? <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it was a really pretty movie, though. Just from a completely production visual standpoint, I thought all the angles were well thought out. Every shot looked great. Um, I thought the music was good, even though it was obviously inspired by Tarantino. Um, I think ultimately what we've got here is a very, very talented director, or pair of directors, I yeah, guess, it's in this a team. case, that... Don't write a very good script. You know what I think, too? Is maybe the team aspect hurt this movie a little bit. Maybe. Because there's there's some good and some bad here. And there's it feels like you're being pulled different directions yeah. with the vibe of the movie. I like a cohesive vibe yeah. in the movie. A cohesive feeling. Yeah. You can go up and down in your feeling, but I don't want to feel this dirty, grimy feeling. Then it's this. Then it's that. Then it's this. Then it bounced around a lot. It's almost like they were pulling, you know, here's the movie in the middle and then one of them grabbed the movie's left hand, and one of them grabbed the movie's right hand. They said, "No, mine. Yeah, I want to do this. Too no, many, too many cooks spoiling the pot." Yeah, kind of thing. It could, that could have been the case, but yeah. who knows? Maybe they worked together flawlessly, but that that could be one explanation yeah. for me. So, yeah. if, if you want a movie that's like this but much better, I'd suggest watching The Salt and Sea instead. I like that. Val Kilmer, right? Yeah, yeah. Great, great movie. Um, very grimy and dirty yeah, as well. Yeah, uh, and very cerebral. But yeah. also very violent, yeah. and and I think this could this movie described itself as a cerebral movie, and that's again one of you those don't things do that, that. You, you don't do that. You don't let someone else. You call don't it that. do that. Yeah, you just don't do that. So, IMDb gave this fucker five point three. What would you give it? Um, I gave it a five. Give it a five because okay. because it was pretty. It was well acted. It sounded good. It looked great. It was just a bad script. And so I just cut it right, cut that baby right down the middle and said, you know, directors, make another movie. Absolutely make another movie. Work with this cast. Do your thing, but get a better writer. I gave it a 5.5, but I did like it less than you. Uh, the reason I gave it a 5.5 is, again, I was just not in the right mindset when I watched it. So I bumped my rating up by a full point to give it the credit it deserves. It is someone's art. Yeah. Don't want to shit all over it. So. Yeah. I won't shit all over it, but I will give it 5.5. Nurse flicking boners. Woo! <laughs> That's the sound of a nurse flicking no, a boner. <laughs> they just have this technique, you know? Yeah. You think you get an attractive what... nurse, you drop your pants, you're trying to get a physical as a young boy, you're trying to get a little bit of a woody. Trying to get physical. A little bit of the physical. mahogany, as they would say. <laughs> get a little bit of a woody. Nurse gives a loose flick. And then it goes right down. Yeah, that that loose flick yeah. where people do that with their hand. Yeah, she did that to my dick. That actually happened to you. Do you think I'm smart enough to make that up? <laughs> Was I giving you too much credit there? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Eighth grade football had to take a physical. Yeah. Physical. I don't know what a physical is, but I had to take a physical. And yes. Wow. My dick was flicked by the nurse. She said, "Don't worry." I was like, uh, "Sorry, don't worry." <laughs> Wow. So technically you got some. I did ejaculate at the moment of contact. Yeah? No, I didn't really. (laughs) That was my first ever experience in BDSM. (laughs) You lost your virginity. Maybe the man I am today. (laughs) (laughs) All right. 
that's enough about the movies. Yeah. We will be back with the top five horror hamlets. Horror, that's good. Cities terror towns. Terror towns, carnage cities. <laughs> Continue. Yeah. Continue. Like that. Continue. I, I can't, I got nothing. Brutal bugs. <laughs> Continue. Cities of castration. I already said cities, you yeah. can't say the same. Cities of castration, yeah. what are you... What is wrong with you? I think a dick gets cut off in one of my movies. Maybe not. I don't know. I know a dick got flaked. You really... Yes, a dick did get flaked, but you really just took the wind out of the sails. I did. I did. My punny end of this segment. It's... Yeah. I threw out the first pun and that was all I had. That was... That was it. Just like... And I got that initial boner. Yeah. Got that flick. That's all I had. Yeah. I just flicked your boner. You just flicked my boner. (laughs) You just flicked my segment banner. <laughs> You've ruined half the movies. Good thing I'm dressed like a nurse, too. <laughs> it's a good thing. We'll be back with the top five horror towns after this. Available now at gravecommand.bandcamp.com. The debut album of Grave Command. Yeah, what happens when you get deep, crust, grindcore, and combine it with Motorhead? It gets brutal as fuck. That's when you get Grave Command. We are not fucking around, ladies and gentlemen. It is my band, Grave Command. It's our first CD. It is available now. Soon it will be coming out on vinyl record, CD, and even cassette. It and eight tracks. Anything like Hollow Notes. Yeah. It doesn't sound like Hollow Notes, and we're gonna have eight tracks, cassettes, CDs, vinyl records, yeah, any format. Hand crank phonographs, laser discs. <laughs> You're gonna etch it into a cave wall. Those and little play it on a pan flute. <laughs> Those little wax tubes. Yeah. You know Thomas Edison first recordings. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna go that far to get this fucker out there, but. If you guys like punk rock... We're going to have a like blind fucking... homeless man fart it into a can and then mail it to someone. That's exactly what the recording is, though. <laughs> oh, okay. <cool. laughs> but if you guys like punk rock, check it out. Grave Command, we're on Facebook. And you can get some free preview tracks at gravecommand.bandcamp.com. <laughs> With the top five horror towns. Have you thought of any other references to towns in I, horror? I have not. I am I'm a dry well. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> You're a failure. I am. I've, I've just Biff, get you in and here. my mother. Biff, get in here. You're my new co-host. It's taking over. What's your top five horror towns? <laughs> Biff. Biff, Nebraska. <laughs> Durr. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Why don't you just start us off with your number five? My number five? It's a town. It may not be a town in the traditional sense, but it is a town. There's a town of monsters called Midian from the film Nightbreed. It's a cemetery. I didn't keep it in my list because I wanted to do top five cemeteries. Oh. So I limited it off my list, but yes, it is a monster town. Yeah. And it would have been a lot higher on my list if I would allow it, but I'll... I'll I'll allow it, okay? The gavel has been run down. <laughs> Dr. Double Decker has spoken. Yeah. Speaking of Dr. Decker, what about that fucking awesome painting on yeah. Dr. Danny? That thing's the shit. You got a hand painted, one of a kind Dr. Decker painting. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. You gotta put some extra buttons on it. Should have been there at the screening. All right. Well, Midian, it is an awesome town. So, my number five has been on, I think it was on my top five horror TV episodes. Home, Pennsylvania, and the X-Files. Yeah. A town of incestual cannibals. That's right. Such as the hills have eyes. But no, it's on the X-Files, on the Fox Network. On the darkest the episode early, of the X-Files. Yeah, in the early 90s, they showed this fucker. Will your mama out because you got a fucker to make a baby. <laughs> It kept the mom with no legs or arms underneath the bed. And yeah. On like a gurney. Yep. They willed her out for pleasure and breeding. Some fucked up shit. And they had a really nice car. Remember that at the end? Yeah. 
Had a really nice car yeah. with the radio and shit. Well, you know, rednecks tend to have nice cars. Yeah, I guess so. At least one. That is, that is true. There's many others that are non-operable. My number four is Castle Rock, Maine, from various Stephen King stories, including Cujo, Needful Things, and others. And Dead Zone, Dead and Zone. Stand By Me. Yeah? Because that's my number two. Oh. We'll talk about it later. We'll get into that later. My number four, the one thing I always hated about living in Santa Carla is all these goddamn vampires. Yeah, it's an honorable mention for me. The Lost Boys, Santa Carla. It's really Santa Cruz. It's just Santa Cruz with a different name yeah. full of vampires. But you got greased up sax men playing epic still believe songs. You got comic book stores. You got riding motorcycles down the stairs. You got widows on the pier. Hanging off bridges. You got a lot going on in that town. And you know what else you got in there? The Queefer. The Queefs. Queefer Sutherland. Queefer. Resident blonde haired mullet vampire. Number three? Number three. Twin Peaks, Washington from Twin Peaks and Twin Peaks Firewalk with Me. It's on my honorable mentions. I have not seen the new episodes of Twin Peaks yet. I've heard very, very good things about them. Uh, I think it's crazy that they brought it back after so many years. Well, they, they said in the, in the uh, hallucination scene, like 25 years from now, you'll be back. And so, is this a continuation or a sequel or a remake? What is it? It's a, con- it's a continuation. They've got a lot of the original cast members back, playing their same old characters. Uh, Kyle MacLachlan came back as the agent. And, uh, it, it, I believe it does not include Firewalk With Me as canon. Okay. But it, it picks up where the show left off. Okay. And uh, that's all That's all I really know about it, other than apparently it's very good. Uh, but I love the original show. You know uh, what? I've always thought it was a tad overrated. I've never got through the first season. Hmm. And I did like it. I'm a huge fan of Cronenberg and stuff, but it's just not... It comes off like a soap opera, like in the intro and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it gives you that soap opera feel. I know things happen, but... I need to watch me some Twin Peaks. The, the second talks season is it. where it gets really fucking weird. There's there's little hints that it's going to get weird in the first season. I mean, it's David Lynch. You know, David Lynch yeah. is always going to get weird. I said but, David Cronenberg. No, yeah, yeah, David Lynch. Yeah. Um, but, the, yeah, the second season is where it goes off the rails. Um, David Cronenberg. Lynch. Lynchenberg? <laughs> Lynchenberg sounds like a fucking concentration camp. <laughs> <laughs> David Lynchenberg. <laughs> I've actually, uh, I've been to the uh, big waterfall where they shot all the hotel scenes for Twin Peaks. It's up outside of Seattle. It's a really cool place. Waterfall, it goes down so far and the water pressure is so hard that it creates a huge updraft. So if you look down and, and you have hair, I, I don't, it'll like straight up blow your hair back. And wow, people, that's cool. People, it's like, it's against a lot to do it, but they were doing it anyway. They'd throw napkins over the waterfall and they'd, get, they, they'd fly up into the air. Chinese lanterns with the fire. Yeah. <laughs> Starting forest fires. <laughs> My number three is Pleasant Valley, Georgia. I did not. I did not put it on the list based on the Herschel Gordon Lewis. Mm-hmm. I put it on the list based on the remake. Okay. And then happened to. I came up with the top five horror towns a couple weeks ago before we even talked about right. doing after movies with Herschel Gordon. Lewis. Yeah, you had it's mentioned a, it. Yeah, it's a Kowinky Dink. Kowinky Dink. But Pleasant Valley, Georgia, with the fucking. Crazy people. There's a bunch of incestual, hot ass twin redneck sisters and Asian girls taking their tops off and people being drawn and quartered. Eaten. Eaten. Man Man Pondo. Robert England. I love me some 2001 Me. Yes. I gotta go back and watch that again. It, it fucking holds up, dude. It is a, it is a, it goes down smooth. It's an easy watch. Yeah. It's a good movie you can just have on in the background. It's not a challenge. Fall, fall asleep to it. All right. Jerk off to it. Yeah. My number two, Hobbs End, New Hampshire, in the Mouth of Madness. That's my number one. We'll go back to it then. So, my number two, Castle Rock, Maine, Needful Things, Stand By Me, Cujo, The Dead Zone. Many of Stephen King's stories have taken place in Castle Rock, Maine. A lot of fucked up shit happens there. There is. There's stores where you can sell your stole. Your your stole? Your stole? Soul? Soul your soul. <laughs> Stole your soul? You can steal, maybe you can steal other people's souls from me. I'm tired. Give me a break. Yeah. <laughs> there's rabbit dogs. There's, there's rabbit, rabbit bats and rabbit dogs. Boy. There's Christopher Walken. 
walking around touching people. Yeah. He's touching people touching inappro- inappropriately. And Queefer Sutherland making his second appearance on wow. this here list. There's a lot of Queefers on this As list. As Ace. That's right. Dual Ace. Queef. <laughs> the Queef Zone. It's one big one and then one little one. It's like... Yeah, that works. It's like... Because it's a bigger role in the last it, one. Yeah, it's him and then a midget version of him. <laughs> I'd like to see a midget Queefer Sutherland. Yeah. I mean Queefer. Queefer. How dare I say the wrong name? And yep. my number one, your number two, Hobbs and New, New Hampshire, in the Mouth of Madness. A great fucking story. Great film. Great film. Fucking weird ass movie. John Carpenter's love letter to H.P. Lovecraft. It is. And it does deliver. Sutter Kane. I put it off as a kid for so long. Yeah? Because it was about a writer. That and Prince of Darkness. I put it off for a while, you know, until I didn't see them both until I was maybe like 14. Yeah. Maybe. And one of them is much better than the other. <laughs> yeah. I'll go out of saying that. When we did our yeah. Nostalgia Killers, I'm not a big fan of Prince of Darkness anymore. Mm-hmm. I know you are more than me, but if you had to compare the two, oh, yeah. The Mouth of Madness is far superior. Definitely the superior movie. The dude on the bike. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> I'm going to watch that tonight. I'm going to watch me some In the Mouth of Madness I think tonight. I, I think I might too. I might go home and watch that. Or I might watch my number one. Oh. Silent Hill. I knew it would be on your list. My my horror time. How could I how could I deny it? <laughs> yep, that was the uh We the, would have had the same one and two if it wasn't for Silent Hill. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But Damn you, Silent Hill. Great video games. Competent movie. Sequel did not exist. I liked the Silent Hill movie. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. It was it, yeah, I it's it, if I had never played the games, I think I would like the movie a little bit more. But it is a good movie. It is an entertaining yeah. movie. It's a very, very well shot, very pretty movie with excellent monsters. Yeah, there's questionable CGI looking back, but it was a while back, so yeah. it's not like it's present. Day. And nowhere near the questionable CGI in the second movie that was never made. <laughs> the second movie that was never made? Yeah. yeah. I think I watched like the first 15 minutes and said, fuck this, and turned it off. Yeah, it's so fucking like, awful. It's like Silent Hill Twilight. Is that what it's called? It's called Revelation, I think. Um, but it was never made. It was so. never made, so... Yeah. <laughs> honorable mentions. Oh, well, wait. Before we get to honorable mentions, I have a zero. Oh. I have a zero. I was worried it might be on your list, but... Arkham. Miskatonic University and many other... Fuck. H.P. Lovecraft-related yeah. tales. Yeah, that's right. Take place I don't even know why that didn't cross my mind. Probably because there's not a lot of movies set there. There's not a lot of movies there is, though. Yeah. There's pieces, you yeah. know. But, uh, yeah, there's no good movies set there. I'll say that. I'll yeah. throw, go out and say that. Was, was it From Beyond set there? I don't think so, but, like, uh, there's references to Miskatonic University and Reanimator, yeah. which also is an Arkham. Like, it's it's tied to some good movies, but the movies that are there, like Lurking Fear and stuff like that, it's not that great, you yeah. know? There's a bunch of... There's more bad H.P. Lovecraft movies than good. Absolutely. So, which is unfortunate, because... But, like, fish with the bag. Honorable mentions. In Boca, Spain, Dagon. Oh yes, Fish Town, Fish Town, Fish Lady, Fish Lady here in the sky from down to the end of your family. <laughs> the Salton Sea in the Salton Sea, <laughs> making a double appearance on this episode. Also, wow, more of an exploitation movie than a horror movie. So I oh, also, got some horrific elements. Also, a real place. Um. Quest of Verde, California, Poltergeist, and as mentioned earlier, Santa Carla, California, and The Lost Boys. That's it, huh? Yep. I got a lot more than you. You miss some very, very important cities. I left them out intentionally, actually. Such as my tied for number three of the most obvious cities, Crystal Lake, New Jersey, Springwood, Ohio, Haddonfield, Illinois. Yeah. One that I thought was going to be on your list is a little town called Nilbach. If you, look oh, in your, fuck. if you look in your rear view yeah. mirror, it spells Goblin. Dun, dun, dun. And troll. Potter's Bluff from Dead and Buried. I've never seen Dead and Buried. Dude, you need to see you some Dead and Buried. Yeah. It holds up. It's yeah. good. I, uh, when I was doing my research, it kept popping up. And I was like, I've never seen that. Let me check it out. That's what happened to me when I was in that nurse's office. I was doing my research. It kept popping up. It kept popping up yeah. and getting flicked, repeated flicks. <laughs> you know those little eggplant memes? <laughs> I started that shit. Yeah, that was my you. dick was purple and swollen. <laughs> Silent Hill, 
Gatlin, Nebraska, Children of the Corn. Oh, yeah. That's a good town. Your favorite town, Amityville, New York. Fuck that. You love you some Amityville. Fuck that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sleepy Hollow is a town. It is. Pontypool is a town. It is. Twin Peaks, as you said. Snowfield, California, in Dean Koontz's Phantoms. They made a movie of Phantoms with Ben yeah. Affleck, which is not as good as the book. The book is far superior. The movie is still worth a watch if you're a fan of Dean Koontz. If you're not a fan of Dean Koontz and you don't read, don't watch it. I enjoyed the movie. I've, I've never really... I don't think I've read any Dean Koontz. But then I, just don't I've, pay I've, any attention to what I see. But I like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I'm a huge Dean Koontz fan. I've read like all of his books besides the last like 10 years, so all the good ones. Mm-hmm. You know? Probably like 100 books, so... Uh, dark city is a city it's a city and it's dark yeah and you gotta get to the beach bro Salem's Lot also a town the Halloween town from Nightmare Before Christmas yeah <laughs> Aaron Island from Grabbers yeah Cherry Falls you have to lose your virginity or you will die <laughs> if you live in Cherry Falls Little Town from Maine from Storm of the Century another Stephen King Brigton, Maine, from The Mist. A lot of Maine. Ludlow, Maine, from Pet Cemetery. Wheelsy, South Carolina, from Slither. Surprised that was not here. Yeah. I thought it was. And then Derry, Maine, from It. I should have put that up one because it would have been cohesive with all my Stephen King, but... With your, your main... Your main, uh... My uh, main vein you were on a flick. <laughs> Flicked by a nurse, my Flicked main the main vein. vein. And my last honorable mention, Erie, Indiana. I forgot about that show. Yeah. Disney horror. Yeah. It was good, though. <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah. It was more weird than, than horrific, but it was good. It was for kids. And that is it for the horror towns. What do we got next week? I don't know. I shot you out a list of Eileen suggestions. Yeah. We know about our serial killers. Yeah. We know about our more sequels. What do you want to do? Let's do a... Uh... Didn't Eileen suggest Eldritch Monsters? She did. Yeah. Eldritch Abominations. Yeah. Horrible monsters from horror. Basically, H.P. Lovecraft monsters. You right. know what? Let's let's wait a little bit for that because there's been a lot of H.P. Lovecraft in this episode. Okay. We're gonna have a lot of repeats next. So. Okay. You wanna do plants? She suggested plants. Plants. Unusual weapons. Horror plants. Yeah, let's do plants. You want to do horror plants? Yeah, I, I, I actually have a I have a couple ideas already. So well, we've see, officially yeah. planted the seed for the next Ooh. episode. Perhaps it will grow to fruition, <laughs> and then we will harvest it as we get into our top five horror plants. Yes, and as H.P. Lovecraft once said, see. <laughs> Licked his boner <laughs> while dressed like a nurse. <laughs> if it smells like fish, throw the fucker back. I love living in the city. I love living in the city.